Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be with you this morning. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Mark uh, chapter 4. I want to just start looking here a little bit at Mark, uh, Mark 4 and verse, uh, verse 11. Jesus is talking. What is that? What is that? No more? Yeah, maybe. It's, Jesus is talking uh, here in Mark uh, 11. He's tra- talking to um, his disciples, and he says, Uh, To them, he says, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables. So he he goes on uh, after that, discussing with his disciples a little bit. But um, he says to them, it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Uh, And I I think about that a little bit. And and what I see and and what I, I... think is that they didn't really understand uh, that mystery. He says it's given to you to know the mystery, but they didn't know it yet. They didn't understand it yet. They didn't fully uh, comprehend it yet. After years of walking with Jesus, uh, we know that at at the very end of Jesus' earthly ministry, the disciples are saying things like, well, Lord, will you then restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still looking for that earthly kingdom, still looking for all the things of the world, still looking for that earthly uh, kingdom and, and uh, wealth and status and, and all of those things. Lord, will you then restore the kingdom to Israel? See, it was given to them to know and understand the kingdom, but... They didn't fully understand the kingdom. They didn't fully uh, uh, comprehend what was theirs. And the reason for that is the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. The Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out. They had not yet received that baptism in the Holy Spirit. They had not received that yet. So flip on over a little bit. They, they, they have been given the mystery to understand the mystery, but they didn't yet understand it. Turn on over to 1 Corinthians. Look at chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Now, uh, Paul was writing to the Corinthians here, right? And what is different now than what Jesus speaking to his disciples and what, what's different? Remember, the disciples, you know, they, they uh, faded away from Jesus. They, they ran off, you know, they hid. They denied him, if you will. What's different now? With Paul writing to the Corinthians, the Holy Spirit has been poured out. The baptism of the Holy Spirit has taken place. The church has been birthed. And this fullness of the Spirit is in the disciples. And however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age. The wisdom of this age is faulty wisdom. The wisdom of this age is based on men's reasoning. Men's logic, men's thoughts. The wisdom of this age is is, uh, 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 post-modernism, a a post-Christian worldview, right? Now, in the day that Paul was speaking, it was uh, not a post-modernism. It was a uh, paganism, just an out-and-out paganism. Different. There's a difference, a little bit of difference. Most people in in the world that Paul um, in the world that Paul was writing into and ministering in, most people believed in God. They just believed in the wrong God. Today, there's more and more of a, a humanism, more and more of a, a no belief in God. 
you know, uh, as opposed to um, the pagan world that Paul was ministering in in that day. But he said, but in either case, the wisdom of this age is built upon very faulty foundation. In, the, in our case, it's built on no God. The wisdom of this age is built on you evolved from an ape. And, and if that is true, then logically it is also true that I can kill you and it means nothing. I can kill my unborn child and it means nothing. Right? And in the pagan age in which Paul uh, uh, was ministering here, in that age of, of human history and existence, Men believed in gods, but it was all right to sacrifice your child to one. You know, uh, the, the uh, uh, things that were done in the name of false deities. The wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, <laughs> who are coming to nothing. Isn't that something? One day it's all going to come down. It's all going to come to nothing. All of our wisdom, all that we have built. Man has built so many things upon this earth. Praise God for it. It's, it's wonderful what we have done. But it all will be shown to be rubble, waste, nothing in the end. It will all be shown to be no wisdom at all. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Here he is, Paul's talking about that same mystery that Jesus talked to his disciples about. Yet we know the disciples didn't comprehend it, but now we see this mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Now we see the one thing I want to want to make mention of the word mystery in the New Testament. The word mystery doesn't mean something that's difficult to comprehend or, or that type of thing. It carries with it uh, a different connotation. It carries with it the meaning that it is something that can only be known or grasped if God reveals it. Now that's different than something that is can be known or understood by human understanding, something that can be known or understood by through experimentation, through study, uh, with much reasoning uh, and much hard work on our part, et cetera, et cetera. That's very different than, than that, right? Very different than that. It is uh, a mystery that is only able to be comprehended if God releases it if God uh, reveals it to us. Let's read just a little bit and see. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. So when was this mystery designed or planned? Not yesterday. <laughs> Before the world began, this mystery was designed, was planned, was thought through in the mind of, of God, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would not have crucified him. So when he's talking about this, he's saying none of the natural rulers uh, comprehend it. Natural man doesn't comprehend it. Neither did the demons or Satan himself comprehend it. That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying if they comprehended it, they would not have crucified Christ, for that crucifixion had to come. It had to take place. They could have, you know, the enemy of our souls, had he comprehended, had he understood, could have thwarted God's plan just by letting Christ live. <laughs> right? So to speak. <laughs> he could have tried, yeah. It reveals to us what an inadequate enemy Satan is. 
It reveals to us. Reveals it to him too. <laughs> reveals it to himself, to Satan himself. It's revealed. What an inadequate enemy he is. But it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That's a quote from Isaiah 60-something. It's a quote from Isaiah. I hath not seen nor ear heard speaks of the uh, sensory knowledge, right? Reveals to us different ways that we might know things and learn things. And we might even know God in some sense by our, our sensory knowledge, right? I mean, we can feel uh, 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 the presence of God in reality, can we not? We can feel the, his presence in some ways. It, it comes with a sensory thing. We hear him. It, it, can, it can be, in, in one sense, a, a sensory revelation. Yet anything that we can know of God through our senses, our sight, our hearing, our speech, our touch, any, any of that is inadequate sensory knowledge or, or um, uh, perception. And then it also reveals to us, nor has entered into the heart of man those things which God has prepared. Uh, uh, we're, we're talking here then about conceptual knowledge. I mean, you can think about things and understand things to a certain degree through your mind. You can study nor has entered into the heart of man the will and the emotions, etc., of man, the heart speaking of that, that seat of our intellect and being, uh, neither has entered into us uh, uh, that understanding by our, our uh, perceptual or conceptual knowledge. The things that God has prepared for those who love Him. Love Him speaking of spiritual knowledge. Isaiah speaks of, of three, three kinds of, of different ways of experiencing or knowing God. And that, that third one, loving Him, speaks of the, the spiritual knowledge. And Paul goes on and... and, and Paul goes on and, and begins to talk more about this. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Through his spirit. God has revealed to us the things that he has prepared for those who love him through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. We can't comprehend the deep things of God with our intellect. We can't find them out by researching and studying. It doesn't, never hurts. But that's not how we're going to understand the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So what changed in the disciples from understanding that mystery or from that mystery which Jesus said to them, it's been given to you to understand the mystery. Yeah. Pentecost is what changed. Pentecost is what happened. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. They were yielded to the Holy Spirit. And now that spirit of man that was in them that knows the deep things of man is able to know and hear and comprehend and understand the deep things of God. Apart from that, this faith becomes ritual. Memorizing. 
doing the do's and doning the don'ts, so to speak. I don't know about you, but I'm not that good at that. Doing the do's and doning the don'ts. I'm just not that good at it. It's got to be something more. And that something more is the, the, the spirit of man in you that knows the deep things of you personally. Those things that no one else knows. Your spirit knows. Your spirit knows. And the spirit of God knows the deep things of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. That we might know his salvation. That we might know his grace. That we might know his peace. How do we have peace in the midst of a storm? How do we, have, how do we receive grace to do that which we think we cannot do? By his Holy Spirit. By his Holy Spirit. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. People try to comprehend all, all, all the spiritual wisdom and mysteries and the knowing God. They try to comprehend it with their mind. With their mind. They try to comprehend it with their own reasoning and own logic. And it never, ever works. It can't work. Because the things of the Spirit of God are spiritually discerned. The natural man cannot receive them. What changed in the disciples that they could receive the, the, the spiritual things of God. What changed in Paul that he could go from a murderous man named Saul to a man who wrote, wrote this thing we're reading now. What changed in him as he was converted he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. Spoke with other tongues. Paul said, Paul said, I, I, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Maybe that's why he wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. Because he spoke in tongues more than all of us. <laughs> right? But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Paul was blessed with revelation to write literally about two-thirds of the, of the New Testament. The natural man does not receive the, the things of God, for they are spiritually discerned. So what happens when the Holy Ghost takes up residence in you? Jesus talked about it. Remember, he said, the Father and I are one. He said that, that, um, that the Father and I are one. So when, when the Holy Ghost takes up residence in you, that third person of the Trinity is making you one with the Godhead, so to speak. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that, we may, that he may instruct him? Who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. Holy Ghost is in you. You have the mind of Christ within. 
you have the mind of Christ that you can discern the things of God. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. Look over at Ephesians 1.9. Look again at what Paul is writing. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery. Again, here's that, that mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Here he is making all things one in Christ. Doesn't the Bible, didn't Jesus say we are, you know, that he and the Father is one, and now he's making all things one in Christ, he's making, doesn't he say that the body of Christ, that we are all one in him? He's making all things one in him. He's gathering all things together into, into one, if you will, in himself. In the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory. Verse, uh, let's just continue to read. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee. He's the down payment. He's the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. He's the down payment. Who's that down payment? The Holy Spirit. Until the fullness, the total, complete fullness comes. The fullness of his kingdom coming to reign and rule planet Earth. He's the guarantee of our inheritance. The guarantee, the down payment of it. The Holy Spirit is given as our guarantee. And then Colossians chapter 1. Look at Colossians 1. Let's look at verse uh, 26. The mystery. There's that word mystery again. Something that cannot be known unless God reveals it. Something that cannot be known unless God reveals it. Of which the mystery which has been hidden from the ages, from generations. But now has been revealed to his saints. This mystery of God has been hidden and now it's revealed. It's been hidden. It's been hidden for thousands of years. And now it's revealed. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. God willed it to be known to us. Among the Gentiles, not just to the Jewish people, but to us, to 
to the Gentiles, to all of us who are engrafted into his family, into his kingdom, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit was the, the mystery that's revealed. The Holy Spirit, I should say it this way, reveals that mystery in us. The Holy Spirit is, is, is he who reveals to us the, the, the triune nature of God, the Trinity. He's the one who reveals to us that we are a part of the kingdom of God, that we're a part of God's family, that we're a part of the church of Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who reveals this to us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the Holy Spirit that is revealing God's will in our lives. It's the Holy Spirit that is doing all the work of, of sanctification in us. The hope of glory. Christ sanctifying us sanctifying us by his blood. That blood is applied by the Holy Spirit in our spirit, if you will, with us in, in our hearts. That blood applied to the, to, the, uh, to the mercy seat, the depth of our, own, of, of our own being. The Holy Spirit applying the blood of Jesus Christ brings us understanding of, of our own, very own uh, unrighteousness and his righteousness. What a difference. What a difference. Paul, Paul now writes and, the, and, and Peter writes and the John writes and James writes and the, the disciples write of the mystery and its fulfillment. Christ in us the hope of glory. They write of that and not the mystery that we can't know. And the thing that intervened was the Holy Spirit. Baptism, the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Father, we love you. Bless you today, Lord. We come into your presence and receive that Holy Spirit Lord, we receive your Holy Spirit. We bless you today. We honor you. We call upon you, Lord Jesus. We call on you, Father. In every area of our lives, Lord, we need you. We ask you to fill us. Fill us, Father, to a, a, a greater depth. Give us that, that hunger in our soul and spirit that comes uh, just that desire, that depth of desire to know you, the power of your resurrection. Holy Spirit, we ask you to fill us. Fill us. Fill us today. Fill us every day. Father, we know that your word tells us to be filled, to be continually filled to be being filled, to keep on being filled. We ask you to fill us with your spirit. Father, we love you. Bless you, Lord. If anyone needs prayer this morning, please feel free to come forward. We'll be happy to pray for you, pray with you. Father, we love you bless you this morning. We love you and honor you and bless you today, O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. We ask, Father, that you would fill us this day with your Holy Ghost. Fill us this day with your Spirit, Father. We just, just press into the Lord right now. Press in. Press in. Press in. Press in. Oh, love. Father, we call on you today. Holy Spirit, we call on you today. 
Revealed by the power of your grace working in us, Father. Reveal the power of your Holy Spirit today working in us. Father, we love you. We bless you today. We call on your name today, O oh Lord. We call on you for salvation. We call on you for healing. We call on you, Father, to reach the very depths of our, of our heart. Now root out everything, Father, that is not of you in us, Lord. Father, we love you. Bless you. We love you, Father. We love you. Father, we say come and have your way in us. Have your way in each and every one of us today, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You go with God today.